Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Yes, this is the weekly recap of all the top stories we previously discussed throughout the week, all conveniently located in one location. So we enjoy it. Understand it's the news from this past week. Hope you enjoy it. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk. The trial of Alec Murdoch has begun today, and we're obviously going to bring you the latest. We are bringing it to you live. Now, unfortunately, the court is not allowing cameras during the jury selection process, uh, except for the uh, big state seal uh, that goes be, uh, behind the court. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the case, Alec Murdoch uh, is uh, facing uh, charges in a long list of uh, criminal and civil allegations. Now, this is the trial, the two counts of homicide, plus a sundry of other charges related to the death of his wife, Maggie, and their son, Paul, which goes back to June 7th of 2021. Now, these deaths were kind of the uh, beginning of the end for Alec Murdoch and the uh, family dynasty that took place down there in the low country of South Carolina for about the last 100 years. Now, since the death of Maggie and Paul, old Alec Murdoch has been disbarred and has been linked to several other deaths in the community. Of course, we'll give him the presumption of innocence, all of those, right? Unless and until a jury of his peers convicts him or whether he is uh, found guilty by a plea of guilty in a court of law. So old Alec Murdoch showed up to court today. Obviously, he's in custody but he's wearing his uh, white button-down shirt and some gray slacks, and he vehemently denies any involvement in the death of his wife and son. He does face up to life in prison without parole and a minimum of 30 years if he's convicted. Now, jury selection is supposed to last several days, and if you've been listening to it, it sounds like it is gonna take more than just a couple of days. Why, you may ask? Well, as we were talking about on the show, this is the most important part of the trial. And if you were listening to the jury selection, they have various panels because they have called in some 900 jurors. And they're excusing a lot of jurors when they asked, who here has heard anything about this case? Please stand up. And they're going to talk to those individuals in chambers to see whether they believe that they can be fair and impartial. There were some jurors that when asked, you've heard something about this case, have you already formed an opinion about this case? And the jurors stood up, they were immediately excused. And so since this is a relatively small community, you know, they're going to have to go through a lot of jurors. But like I have said, regardless of how much publicity a case has received, there were in fact a few jurors that had not heard anything about this case as of yet. And I assure you, they are going home this evening and will be Googling everything about Alec Murdoch. But the way things are going, like I said, we're going to bring you gavel to gavel uh, coverage. Uh, I would expect maybe a jury selected by Wednesday, maybe, hopefully, maybe a little sooner, probably by Wednesday, maybe opening statements if we're lucky midday on uh, Wednesday, but my guess is maybe Thursday. I'm thinking Thursday. You just never know how long it's going to take. You don't know how long it's going to take in chambers to do that. And as we saw today, the judge was very strict. He told the jurors after taking a lunch break to be back at approximately 2.30. He admonished the jurors, three of them, for not being back on time. He basically said, it's a court order. It's not a suggestion. Please comply. Somehow, I don't think if those jurors remain, they will... Uh, take the uh, court's order to return at any time as a mere suggestion. I think this trial, because I've said it from the beginning when the whole Mallory Beach accident took place where uh, Paul was driving the boat and Mallory Beach uh, passed away when the boat hit the bridge, just something didn't seem right. I've been following this case for a long time. And then on June 7th of 2021, obviously near the dog kennels on the 1700 acre hunting property, of uh, the Murdochs, uh, Paul and Maggie were, were gunned down, and prosecutors say that uh, Paul Murdoch used a shotgun, removed the better part of uh, his son's uh, skull, uh, which was severed allegedly from the body, and uh, Maggie was uh, shot several times, 
least five times, including in the back and in the head, and she died about 30 yards from her son. The prosecutor suggests that the uh, that uh, Paul and uh, Maggie were killed because of mounting debts and the fear that his decade-long scheme of embezzling client funds as well as funds from his law firm was going to be exposed. Now, Murdoch alleges that he found his wife and son's deceased bodies at about 10.06 p.m. when he placed a hysterical 911 call to the police. And um, he basically says that he has an alibi that he was visiting his ailing mother at the town nearby in an assisted living center. Alec Murdoch has a uh, uh, remaining son, Buster, who it's unclear, but it doesn't look like he's really supporting his father because, well, somewhat a lot of the evidence tends to show that maybe he may have had something to do with it. Well, needless to say, like I said, uh, and the Murdochs had enormous uh, power, uh, both political as well as in the uh, low country because they had four generations. Four generations served as prosecutor and solicitor overseeing five counties there on the southern tip of the state. Now, that family influence, like I said, began to uh, crumble, so to speak, when Paul Murdoch was accused of slamming his father's boat into the pilings of the bridge in Beaufort, South Carolina, when Mallory Beach uh, passed away. There were four other people that were injured. And that triggered a series of lawsuits that uh, spotlighted Alex's alleged crooked financial dealings. The South Carolina Law Enforcement Division has reopened investigations into the mysterious 2015 death of Buster's classmate, Stephen Smith, with whom Buster was uh, rumored to have been uh, close with. So like I said, keep joining us. We'll be bringing you live coverage from gavel to gavel for the Murdoch case. <laughs> we'll give them the presumption of innocence. Let me know in the court of public opinion, whether what we know thus far, guilty or not guilty. But keep an open mind. I would urge you to keep an open mind. Keep an open mind. Let's pretend we're jurors on the case and say, we're not going to consider anything, only what is considered in court. What should be considered is what is admitted in court. Let's think of it that way. Like many Americans, we got a dog during the pandemic. My quarantine dog, Miss Winnie the Bulldog. Now, Miss Winnie has grown accustomed to being around us all the time. When we were leaving the house, Winnie would have extreme anxiety, so we decided to look for natural products to help with her anxiety. We looked for the highest quality CBD treats, and we were not satisfied, and neither was Winnie. So we created a high quality CBD product that absorbs faster and provides the required results faster. Baked in Colorado CBD treats and beverage enhancers are made with nanotechnology. The nanotechnology makes the CBD extraction more pure, also allows for Baked in Colorado products to work faster. Baked in Colorado products can help reduce your pet's anxiety, ease joint pain, and help with your dog's skin problems. Go to our online store and see what Baked in Colorado product is best for your dog. When you order at bakedincolorado.com, enter code WINNIE and receive 15% off your first order. We have a 30-day money-back guarantee. If your dog does not experience the desired results in 30 days, return the product and we will refund your money. No questions asked. Brian Koberger's attorney. Oh, I think they've got a problem. So, Brian Koberger's public defender has actively represented a parent of one of the four Moscow uh, stabbing victims that her client now, Brian Koberger, is accused of killing. That's right. Ann Taylor, the chief of the uh, public defender's office there, filed an attorney notice of withdrawal with the court for the parent on January 5th, the same day that Koberger made his first court appearance in Idaho there in Lata County. So what does that mean? It means that they obviously did a conflict search and realized that, oh my goodness, We've represented somebody who could be a potential witness in the case. I will explain. So this parent was previously sentenced on an unrelated misdemeanor charge. And in that case, as well as another where the parent faces two felony charges, the public defender's office withdrew in favor of a local criminal defense attorney unrelated to Taylor or the county's public defender's office, which is typical when there's a conflict, they appoint a private attorney. That just depends on the system that is set up in each state. Well, the new attorney is listed as, quote, paraphrasing, conflict public defender, end quote. That is a court-appointed counsel at state expense 
but he is a private attorney when there's a conflict with the public defender's office. So clearly, there's a conflict. The question is, however, should the public defender get off of Koberger's case and not that of one of the Kernodals? Now, the only reason these criminal charges are uh, apparently being reported is to establish the connection between public defender Taylor and the family of the homicide victims. Now, let's face it, this is a high profile case and there's going to be issues of conflict of interest uh, immediately here at the beginning of the case. And anytime a former client is involved in a current representation, every lawyer needs to evaluate potential conflicts. Now they're factually based and so the lawyer needs to decide whether there is an actual conflict. And when you have, when you do a conflicts check, when a new client comes and says, okay, this is the person. You look at all the witnesses on the list. If you have represented one of the witnesses on the list, 99.9% .9 of the time you have a conflict and you need to get off the case. You can't take it. Just saying, I think there's a big problem here, but we will sh shall continue. So obviously, you know, the four stabbing victims there at the University of Idaho were uh, Madison Bogan, she was a senior, Kayla Gonsalves, uh, she was a junior, Zaina Kernodal, um, also a junior, and uh, uh, Ethan uh, Chapin, who was a freshman. Now, the campus rental house where they died was about nine miles east of Washington State University in Pullman, where Koberger was a PhD student. And Koberger was arrested, obviously, at his parents' home in eastern Pennsylvania uh, on December 30th, ultimately extradited back to Idaho to face the uh, four counts of first-degree murder, as well as a count of burglary, which is where somebody enters the dwelling of another with an intent to commit a crime therein. So public defender Taylor is just one of 13 public defenders in the Idaho uh, system there, the public defender's office that is qualified to lead a capital punishment case. She also is the only one in all of Northern Idaho. Now the prosecutors have yet to indicate whether they will seek the death penalty in the Koberger case. Um, and since 2000, the um, public defender's office has represented the homicides victims' parents off and on in several cases. Now, since uh, public defender Taylor took over the case, her office has defended the parent in four cases, including a misdemeanor from August of 2017, from which Taylor took over as the attorney of record in September of 2022. So this isn't a situation where she is just the office head and she, you know, her name appears on every pleading. She actively took over the case to represent somebody that is now a potential witness, particularly if there is a death penalty. You're going to want to try to talk to those family members to see if there is something uh, that is for mitigation purposes. And remember, the client is the one that holds the privilege. And so the issue becomes, will the attorney use something that they learned in the course of the previous representation for the benefit of the new client, but to the detriment of the old client? So it gets really weird. So Taylor's office has also represented another parent in the Moscow uh, homicides victim in four criminal cases since she became the public defender. In two cases, uh, records show that uh, Taylor was an inactive attorney. Uh, Taylor uh, has led the uh, public defender's office there since 2017, and she previously worked in the same office from 2004 to 2012. Then she shifted to private practice before returning back to be the head of the public defender's office there. Now, like every state, there are rules of professional conduct regarding a conflict of interest, and loyalty and independent judgment are essential elements in any lawyer relationship to a client its rule on conflict and current conflict states, concurrent conflicts of interest can arise from the lawyer's responsibilities to another client, a former client or a third person, or from the lawyer's own interest. Public defenders in Idaho also operate under a little more relaxed conflict rules because of the nature of the work to ensure that the defendants uh, receive adequate legal representation. Uh, now, beyond possible conflicts on the face, um, obviously to any practicing criminal defense attorneys is seeking to speak with family members like we talked about uh, and a possible sentencing to obtain their, you know, what is their position? Is it, should it be a life? Should it be death? Anything along those lines. And effective representation in a capital case, if it's going to get to that penalty phase, 
there's going to be a lot of effort to try and talk to the family. So it makes it a little bit awkward. Now, here's the real catch. If Koberger thinks that there's a conflict, he can say, hey, this attorney has a conflict. I want a new attorney. And guess what? Since the public defender's office would be conflicted, he would get a privately paid attorney, similar to Lori Vallow in her particular case, and probably get two plus investigators and mitigation specialists and what have you. And I'm not saying Miss Taylor, the public defender, is not qualified. She clearly is. But why would somebody risk a conflict on a potential death penalty case when the real simple remedy early on is to get him conflict-free counsel? She represented the previous clients before Mr. Koberger showed up, and they're the ones that the duty lies with in that particular situation. Uh, they should have filed a notice of conflict on Mr. Koberger's case and then appointed uh, new counsel. That's just in my humble opinion. Now, some people will say it doesn't matter. Um, you can Chinese wall off uh, Ms. Taylor from any sort of mitigation, anything having to do with the Kernodal family. Gets a little tricky indeed. You can also get a waiver from both sides saying after they meet with independent counsel that they're satisfied uh, of, of all the risks. But any one of the people that have previously been represented by this particular attorney, Ms. Taylor, could say, no, I'm not waiving anything. And everybody gets new attorneys. So it is a problem that could have been avoided by simply saying there was a conflict early on, or once we discovered it, we're going to withdraw, but they did everything they could early on to protect his rights. Now, we'll see. Hopefully this plays out sooner rather than later, and they don't wait until June 26, which is the next date for the preliminary hearing. All right. Remember the old term, no face, no case? It used to go a long way. You needed a body to show that somebody was, in fact, deceased to show that they were possibly a victim of a homicide. Well, that is changing. And recently, the Anna Walsh case has been the most high-profile missing person case, uh, obviously started this year, after she disappeared just after the first of the year. Now, Brian Walsh, her husband, um, is the one who has been accused of her death. And the real estate executive uh, was last seen uh, by her husband, uh, who claims that she left her Massachusetts home for work uh, to go attend to emergency in Washington, D.C. She never got on a plane and was reported missing on January 4th. Since then, her husband has been charged with the murder, even though no trace of her body has been recovered. And while police believe that they have a strong circumstantial evidence case against Brian, from genetic material to surveillance footage of him buying cleaning materials to uh, his disturbing internet searches, he has pled not guilty to the case. Now, oftentimes people think you can't have a homicide case if you don't have a body to prove that a crime was actually committed. And obviously this is true in some case, but when actually a prosecutor goes to trial with no body, guess what? They have about an 86% chance of a conviction compared to only a 70% chance when they actually have a body, just showing that it's actually higher. So although the history of no body, no murder prosecutions in the United States goes back to the early 19th centuries, the trials are actually quite rare because when you don't have a body, you don't have the best piece of evidence in a homicide case for obvious reasons. And the absence of the body brings an added layer of challenge in the court because it requires the prosecution to prove not only that the defendant committed the crime, but that the victim is actually, in fact, deceased. So when a body is recovered, most times the medical examiner or coroner can determine the cause and manner of death, which is directly related to the charges against the defendant in that particular case. But while the lack of a victim's body poses a challenge for investigators and prosecutors, the ability to hold up a murder conviction in the court hinges on the legal principles of corpus delecti, or body of the crime. Corpus delecti dictates that a suspect cannot be convicted of a crime without sufficient evidence that the misdeed was actually committed. 
in the absence of the victim's remains, homicide cases rely on other convincing physical and circumstantial evidence. One of the most modern cases of the corpus delecti issue is the case of Robert Leonard Ewing Scott, who was sentenced to life in prison back in 1957 for the murder of his wife, Evelyn Thornsby Scott, who was last seen back in 1955. And because Evelyn's remains were never found, Scott's conviction hinged in part on the fact that her glasses, dentures, and other personal belongings were found near an incinerator on their Bel Air property. Although Scott denied killing Evelyn for several years, his obituary states that he confessed to author Diane Wagner after being released on parole in 1978. There have been apparently 576 no-body murder trials in the United States in the last 200 years, with more than half of them occurring since 2000. Obviously, the uptick in those prosecutions is from advanced technology, including obviously the role of DNA, forensics such as fingerprints and electronic trails that outline footprints, including location data, surveillance cameras, ATM transactions, cell phones, which tracks a user's locations and carries a wealth of personal data. I've been saying that for years. Anyway, surveillance footage from the day after Anna was last seen also captured Brian placing two other heavy sets of trash bags in random dumpsters. So prosecutors contend that these bags, which may have included Anna's remains, had already been incinerated by the time the police got to them. In addition to the DNA and suspicious footage, uh, prosecutors allege that uh, Brian's chilling internet search history is evidence of the crime. In the early morning hours of New Year's Day, the father of three allegedly used his son's iPad to look up how long before a body starts to smell and how to stop a body from decomposing. He also searched how long for someone to be missing uh, to inherit. He also looked up best dates to get a divorce for a man. That was on December 27th, just days before Anna disappeared. Rather than divorce, it is believed that Mr. Brian Walsh killed, dismembered Anna, and discarded her body. Mr. Walsh, in this case, obviously checked all the boxes of things you are not supposed to do. Hey, that's what amateurs do. He's writing a segment for Crime Talk on what not to do to get away with murder. And the disappearance of Anna Walsh has some uh, similarities to the case of Jennifer Dulos. As you may recall, she was the Connecticut writer and mother of five who was last seen at her rental home in uh, New Cannon, Connecticut back in uh, May of 2019. We covered that case quite a bit. And at the time of her disappearance, Jennifer was in the process of divorcing her husband, Photos Dulos. And although Photos and his girlfriend, Michelle Traconis, were charged with tampering with evidence and hindering prosecution just a few weeks after Jennifer vanished. Photos was not slapped with capital murder charges related to her death until January 7th of 2020. As we've said many times before, don't harm your spouse, get a divorce. Just saying, try to work it out. That's the best thing to do. Try to work it out. If you can't work it out, don't harm anybody. Just do it that way. Next on the docket, Lori Vallow and Chad Day Bell. First, the victim's family in the Lori Valla Chad de Bell matter want the judge to reconsider having cameras in the courtroom. So the family members for JJ Vallow, Tylee Ryan, and Tammy de Bell are asking the judge to reconsider allowing cameras in the upcoming trial of Chad de Bell and Lori Vallow. Chad de Bell and Lori Vallow pled not guilty, obviously, to multiple counts of first degree murder and conspiracy to murder the, um, as it relates to the deaths of JJ, Tylee, and Tammy. Day Bell. Their trial is expected to last up to 10 weeks in Ada County, beginning on April 3rd. Now, as you may recall, Lori Vallow's attorney, Jim Archibald, filed a motion asking Judge Boyce to remove the video cameras from the courtroom, and Judge Boyce was more than anxious to agree and comply with the request, and the prosecutors went along with it. Well, Larry Woodcock, who has called into our Patreon show, that's J.J. Vallow's grandfather, he stated in an interview to East Idaho News, and he says, I can understand keeping the cameras out in a pretrial hearing, but when that trial starts and the jurors are picked, it's time for the public and the families to be able to see what's taking place. I remember Boyce wrote in his September ruling that he found no misconduct from the media in the hearings when the cameras were allowed, but expressed concern about pretrial publicity. 
And that was one of the reasons why he decided to move the case up to Ada County. Now, Tammy Dace Bell's family says that they are not physically or financially able to spend the next 10 weeks and leave their home in Springville, Utah, to go and stay in Boise. Now, I'm sure that the Victim Assistant Impact Funds can help with those uh, arrangements for food and travel and hotel, which the prosecutor should have to pay for. But it would just seem like it'd be so much easier if it was on TV. Anyway, prosecutors, Rob Wood, Lindsey Blake, have said they don't want cameras, but they understand everybody's concern. I don't get it. As we can see on the Alec Murdoch trial, they've made documentaries about the Alec Murdoch case just like they did in the Lori Vallow, Chad Day Bell matter. And that judge, I'm telling you, the judge in the Murdoch case, he has control of that courtroom. And there isn't anybody that's not going to follow his rules, even those experienced attorneys in there who, frankly, have got some pretty big egos. They are going to comply. All it takes is a strong judge making his orders known, and it can be okay. All right. Now, the next thing on the docket as it relates to Lori Vallow, some motions have been filed. Of course, motions are going to get filed. We're getting close to... Um, trial date. But guess what is one of the motions filed by Lori Vallow? Motion to dismiss for lack of speedy trial. Now, I don't know whether the judge is going to grant this motion. Somehow, I doubt it because he believes that he's made the appropriate findings whereby he can extend her trial date past the speedy trial date. And I said, you can go back and look. I said, it's going to create issues. There's going to be a speedy trial argument. And guess what? Lori Vallow's attorneys have said, hey, judge, you need to dismiss the case against Lori Vallow because it is violating her constitutional rights under the United States Constitution under the Sixth Amendment, as well as the state of Idaho Article 1, Section 13 and the Idaho Code, Section 19305. So obviously the uh, attorneys for Miss Vallow go through and say everybody has a right to a speedy trial under the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution, as well as the state constitution there in Idaho. And in fact, the state of Idaho has even codified what is a speedy trial. And they say that under 19-3501, the court, unless good cause to the contrary is shown, must order the prosecution or the indictment to be dismissed in the following cases. If a defendant whose trial has not been postponed upon his application is not brought to trial within six months from the date that the defendant was arraigned before the court in which the indictment is found. Then they cite some case laws saying why it makes sense. Then it goes into the fact of a timeline. February 20th of 2020 just shows you how old this case is now three years. Lori Vallow is arrested in Hawaii. A uh, $5 million bond is set. She's indicted by the grand jury on May 25th of 2021. And then some 10 months later, April 19th of 2022, she is arraigned on the indictment. First trial setting is October 11th, 2022. Second trial setting, January 9th, 2023. April 3rd, 2023, the third trial setting on the indictment. 1,169 days in jail, on any of these cases. Now, the first trial setting in the instant case was for October 11th, since that was within the six months of the April 9th, 2022 arraignment date. The government then asked for more time and the court granted the request and set trial for January 9th of 2022. This violated Ms. Vallow's right to a speedy trial is what her attorneys are arguing. Something Scott mentioned a while back. Lori Vallow's defense team then questioned her competence to stand trial, and the court told the case from October 6th of 2022 through November 15th of 2022. That's a 40-day delay caused by the competency review, but it still doesn't justify the trial setting three years after her arrest and almost one year after her arraignment. The government still has an obligation to bring her to speedy trial, which complies with the Constitution and the Idaho Code is what they're arguing. Now, yes, they're not saying the argument, remember, they're basically saying, yeah, those 40 days while well, she was, they questioned her competency. We get that that doesn't count. The previous 10 months where she was not found competent doesn't really count. But from the time that she's 
said not guilty. She wants her speedy trial, and she's been very unequivocal about that. She should have had her trial date. So therefore, the defense for Lori Vallow saying is undisputed that Lori Vallow Daybell has demanded her speedy trial and has never waived her constitutional rights. She is prejudiced every single day since she's in jail and unable to post bond. The court has repeatedly reminded the government that it will respect her constitutional rights to a speedy trial, and the government cannot show good cause to bring Lori Vallow to trial over three years from her arrest date. So I knew it was going to be an issue. I would have raised it for sure. Um, it's going to be it's going to be good. So the other motion uh, that the defense filed and they want to have a hearing on on February 9th is obviously the motion to dismiss for speedy trial violations, a motion to re- conduct individual voir dire, given the fact that it is a death penalty case, and a motion to disclose the penalty phase information filed on January 26th so that the jurors know what's taking place, and a, a motion for pre-selection instruction to potential jurors filed on that particular date. We won't go into those. Obviously, um, if the uh, (laughs) court were to reverse itself and say that there was not a uh, violation, or I guess I should say, if the court reverses itself and says, you're right, I violated her constitutional rights to a speedy trial, um, we we won't need any of that. Only Chad Daybell would be going uh, to the uh, trial by themselves. Well, some other issues that have popped up as it relates to the trial. Chad Daybell is uh, filing another motion, and he is basically asking the court to sever, to sever the cases of Lori Val and Chad Daybell, inconsistent theory of defenses. Um, Just just saying. Um, I I don't know why they didn't comply. I really don't. I mean, I I get it. It was a complicated case. It was complicated by the competency issues. Chad DeBell had waived his right to speedy trial repeatedly. Uh, but really what it boils down to in this particular case is that um, Lori Vallow never waived her right to speedy trial. Yes, when you have co-defendants in a conspiracy case and one wants to go to trial and one doesn't, you got to kind of, you know, what's a reasonable time? Is the court going to kick the case out? No. But I think... Just another argument on appeal that if there's a conviction, it'll just go on and on and on and on. Next, um, the uh, defense on behalf of uh, Mr. Chad Daybell, they want to ask for additional time in which to disclose their expert witnesses because some of the DNA evidence that has come up has not been turned over just as of yet. And Chad Daybell's attorney, Mr. Pryor, is also saying, I still don't have the forensic DNA reports, numbers 15 and 16, so I can't do my job because the state is uh, dragging their feet. Uh, we'll see how that gets resolved. Obviously, the big issue of the day, Lori Vallow motion to dismiss for violation of her speedy trial rights. I, the defense is going to keep raising that issue. First day of trial, judge dismiss, violate speedy trial rights. Judge Boyce is going to say, hey, they were joined, try co-conspirators together. It wasn't that long of a delay. He's going to find a way to do it. If she's convicted, the appellate courts will decide whether there was a violation of her speedy trial rights. 